And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Elizabeth Sabet. Elizabeth is the past president of the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences, which helps people integrate their experiences into their daily lives, as well as trains mental health professionals on the best clinical practices for STEs. Currently, she serves as an experienced support volunteer and trainer. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I think it's great because I have some NDE guests that appear to be having problems implementing their NDEs into sure. their daily lives. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's common to mm-hmm. have challenges for decades. For decades. Wow. Yes. So, you know, if anybody's watching this and they've been having a hard time uh, integrating their experience and finding peace um, or feeling empty even, that's normal. And it's normal for that to, you know, go on for years without the right support. Hmm. Yeah. Well, how did you get into this in the first place? Well, uh, I've been a, a spiritual experiencer since I was a small child and have had many different types of experiences, including a near death like experience. And uh, so in, uh, 2007, I decided that I needed community that I could understand. I live in a very conservative West Texas town, uh, in Lubbock, Texas, and lots of really good people here. They're just not ready to move beyond their enculturated identities to expand the possibility of more. You know, that's a very safe way of living and there's nothing wrong with it. And, and um, however, where I was in my life, I really needed uh, a community where I could just bring my authentic self. So uh, along with two friends, we co-created a local community uh, that we called Holistic Options for People Everywhere, Hope. And uh, over the years, um, as people came into the community that were looking for a safe space to be different, Um, different than the traditional West Texas uh, Christian um, or traditional Christianity or exploring, you know, their faith. Um, uh, Anybody who had different experiences or strange experiences, um, they soon realized that, you know, they could talk to me about anything and, um, you know, I could be with them and help them work through that. And uh, I and I also had become a coach in 2007 as well, a transformational transpersonal coach. And um, but I usually worked with people on, you know, on a just a spiritual friend level um, in the community. Um, And so one of the people in the community had a unitive state of consciousness experience where she expanded the connection to everything. And it changed her faith. And she was a very strong uh, Christian um, uh, with a narrower perspective of uh, what God wants from us than what she had after her experience. And it ruined her 32-year marriage and her relationship with her children. She was part of our community. She came to our community. She found our community because of this experience and some of the challenges that she was facing and sharing her new understanding about God uh, with her family, just looking for connection and a safe space. You said something, and I wanted to clarify. You said she had a narrower... So prior to her experience, Mm -hmm. she had a narrower perception of what God wanted from us than after her experience. Oh, okay, so prior. After her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was so saying, I thought it was her, after she became more narrow. So that's why I was like, I was oh, no. confused. Oh, no. Now, you know, some people do get a narrower vision after, you know, it just depends on the person. Um, but for this particular person, um, coming from a very um, ultra conservative family and spiritual community, her um, new worldview, her new God view was much broader and more expansive and allowing um, than what she had come from. And she brought me the work of a a book 
called uh, the Stormy Search from uh, the Stormy Search for Self by Stanislav and Christina Groff. And even though I had been doing this work for years, and my coaching method is called the Spirit Path Coaching Method, help you know doing whatever, I had never heard the term spiritual emergency. Hmm. She brought me this book, and as I was reading it, I was stunned that um, my life was in a book. <laughs> you know that this process of having had a spiritual emergency and the integration process of it. Um, so I think I just downloaded my work as I was working with people. I think I just got downloads from spirit. Um, and so she brought this to me and she said, you need to do something about this. Hope needs to do something about this. I can't find a marriage therapist anywhere. And you know, that understands what I'm talking about. And this is ridiculous. And so I said, you know, she's right. We do have to do something about this. And it's ridiculous that we don't have mental health professionals that I can refer my clients to. And I've been having that problem for years that I didn't have a mental health professional, a safe mental health professional that I could refer my coaching clients to when they needed perhaps trauma therapy or marriage family therapy, or, you know, other issues that are not dealt with in coaching. Um, I didn't have a therapist that they could safely bring their whole self into the session. So um, I said, that's it. We're going to we're going to find somebody from the uh, spiritual emergence network that Croft created, and we're going to bring them here and we're going to do an academic symposium and we're going to train these people. And so uh, this woman had found Dr. Janice Holden. She was the only person in Texas that had been trained by Groff's Institute. And so uh, Dr. Janice Holden at that time was, um, at the University of North Texas. And she was teaching counseling psychology. And um, also she had created a program on differential diagnosis between psychosis and spiritual emergence and emergency. And so I contacted her and I asked her if she would come to Lubbock and help me create this training symposium here to train mental health professionals here in Lubbock. Um, and that was under my first, non, you know, my nonprofit hope. And she said, of course. And now, you know, um, Jan is the current president of IANS, the International Association of Near Death Studies. Mm. So she's uh, was the editor of the uh, International Near Death Studies Journal for 30 years. Uh, she's an amazing near death researcher and a very brave and courageous researcher and presenting her work out in the world and to be able to create that program at university level and to teach it, you know, took a lot of courage on her part, right? Because that's not always, uh, it's going out on the fringes of academia um, to be willing to say, look, there is a difference here and we need to do something about it. So when I spoke to Dr. Holden, she said, you know, you need to talk to this woman in California, Yolaine Stout of ASSIST, which I'll get into here in a minute, the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. Jan said, you need to talk to Yolaine because she's doing the same thing that you're doing on a local level, she's doing on a national level with ASSIST. So I called Yolaine and uh, she was very gracious. And she said, here, use our research and use this document uh, that we created the cultural competency guidelines for mental health professionals. Um, just be sure you reference assist. And so from that point, and she'd put on a conference. So my conference was in 2013 and her first conference was in 2012. So, you know, we were kind of running a little parallel to each other in our work. So we had our conference here. We trained some mental health professionals here. And then in 2014, ASSIST had their conference in Dallas and they asked Hope to co-sponsor and uh, we took uh, volunteers to work the conference. And then we also had uh, four people, four or five people get trained and certified at that conference. And then I was invited on the board of ASSIST in 2015, and then I became the president in 2016. Mm. And just recently, this is like my last month, I just 
finished my president duties last week. And so this, what I've discovered for experiencers, uh, and I'm going to segue into kind of, you know, the problem of integration. One of the things that helps support our integration is to have meaningful uh, work around that or to have meaningful conversations about those experiences and the challenges that they bring up in our life and the benefits and the growth um, process that's available to us now that may not have been available prior to the experience. So, you know, it's really helpful. And I know that with my work in learning how to support experiencers from my own downloads from spirit, creating my own program to being willing to put my foot out there in West Texas and say, you know, and we had, we invited, <laughs> and we invited pastors, you know, we had pastoral counselors uh, as well. And I made sure that we weren't just working with the secular therapists that I was inviting um, these uh, spiritual counselors because people were getting kicked out of their church home as it's called in West Texas. And they were being told they were talking to the devil and, you know, whether they were or they weren't, they simply weren't getting any support one way or the other. They were getting shunned and ridiculed. Can you tell us about some of the challenges that people have integrating their NDEs into their life? Sure. So, um, so some of this comes uh, from my own experience, the experience of the hundreds of people I've worked with and from assist research. So one of the main things first internally, the, the internal challenges are understanding the meaning of it. What does this mean? Why did this happen? What am I supposed to do with this now? Because there's not always clear direction. So some near-death experiencers get very clear direction. Go back, take care of this, go do that. Or they come back with different gifts, talents, and skills or missions, right? Those are not easy to implement uh, because it requires courage. It requires having difficult conversations that can be very risky and psychologically unsafe or emotionally painful with loved ones. So when we hit the wall of this resistance, so we have to deal with our own internal resistance first. And then when we finally have the courage to, to come out with our new perspectives or our new values, then we'll hit some kind of outer resistance, okay? And so uh, if there's no proper support for handling both the internal and the external resistance, uh, people can stuff it, stuff it, stuff it. And many people are at risk for suicide because if it was a light filled, um, spiritually transformative experience or NDE. I, and I'm going to use STE here to mean near-death experience or any other non-linear, non-ordinary state of consciousness experience, and even maybe just a gentle nudge that the universe is wanting you to be different. And we can call that a gentle awakening, right? So the other types of resistance could be, um, or challenges is that maybe that you're so exuberant and so filled with light because you had such a blissful experience that you're very open about it and you don't worry about other people's resistance and you are just, you're on a form of crusade almost, right? To help people, you know, drop the fear, feel love, do what makes you happy. And that sometimes scares people in, in their life as well. And we sometimes push people away from us uh, because our energy could be too big. So there's a whole host of other challenges, um, but those are some of the main challenges. There's also the risk of so many people no longer value money. Mm. And so they may be give away all their belongings or most of it, or they quit their jobs and they don't want to work anymore. They can't work because the lighter environment 
that they experienced and the love that they experienced um, is so um, out of contrast, right? There's so much contrast between that experience and the harsh frequency of our world. Um, so that can cause people to go inward and to stay inward. Um, and then when they come to a place of more uh, integration later, they don't have any money to do the things that they want to do now that their, their heart calling has called them to, um, you know, other challenges, there's so many, um, other challenges can be physical challenges where you can come back with, uh, sensitivities to smells or chemicals or even light or even people because you're feeling, you know, the vibration of people and feeling people's frequencies and it's very uncomfortable. So that can be a challenge as well. Um, so those are some of the main challenges, right? Um, but the, uh, well, there's some more internal challenges where, um, you come back and you realize, oh my God, you know, I was an <laughs> or I was really, I wasn't mentally well, and now I have things to clean up in my own behavior, or I can see now how. I should have done something differently and it caused somebody to feel un unlovable. Um, and so some people deal with very strong guilt and shame and regret, and that can also create uh, suicidal ideation in people. Right. So, so many, so many challenges. What about the people who have hellish like NDEs? Yes, of course. For those people, uh, you know, I think, I don't think there's any person that needs any more or less support. I think it's, it's really still the same, right? It's, are they, did they also have an experience of worthiness that they didn't get left there? You know, checking in with it, you know, how worthy do you feel of love now that you were taken out of that space? And what did you see, you know, shadow aspects of yourself? Did you see there that maybe you didn't recognize before? And what motivation um, do you have now to change that? And what support do you need in order to be ch to, to change those? Uh, some people come back from those experiences very, very, very angry at religion. Um, I do um, what's called psychopomp work where I help people cross over and there was an experience that I had a shared hell experience with someone um, as I was taken out of my body to help this person um, transition. And uh, they believed that they were supposed to go to hell. The guy's dying in the hospital by himself in a hospital room, worked hard all his life. And, you know, he's thinking to himself and cussing to himself, you know, blah, blah, blah. I never had an effing break. Nobody ever gave me anything in life, you know, and I had a crap life. And now I've got to go to hell. Mm. And he was very angry about it. And so uh, I ended up following him there. <laughs> wow. And um, had my own experience of it. Um, and, and so, you know, I think those people really, really, really need uh, someone that's trained in uh, shadow work, self-love, right? Uh, some of the hell experiencers that I've talked to, um, they come back full of love, you know, and they do grieve. They are going through a grief process from the way they were before. But in order to survive that, they must learn to forgive. And that's one of those main ex hell experiences is recognizing that we must forgive our failures, mm. that they're part of our learning and our evolution as a soul, right? We can't change what we don't know. So m those hell experiences are there um, to help us. So I, for, I couldn't function for three days after that experience because it was beyond my perception as well, right? It didn't fit my current belief system at that time. And, um, and so I was sitting in my favorite coffee shop that was run by a beautiful Buddhist woman here in town. 
And I would go as soon as they opened the doors and leave when they closed and sat with my books in front of me, pouring through them, trying to reconcile and find an answer for how this could have been possible. You know, there were here, we have this experiential reality called hell that I had come to no longer believe in. And, um, finally this beautiful woman walked by me and I must've been a mess Mm. because she walked by me and she said, friend, you look like you could use a friend. (laughs) And, and I just looked at her. She said, do you know, Bill and Bob? So I looked really bad because that's code word for the 12 step program, right? (laughs) I looked really bad. And here's this woman tattooed, you know, and pierced all over. Honey, do you need a friend? And I just looked at her and I was like, I knew what she was talking about. I have friends in the program. And she said, and I was like, I know what you're talking about, but that's not what this is. She said, why don't I sit down and you tell me what this is? I think you need a friend. Beautiful, beautiful human mm. being. And, and I said, oh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. You would not believe me. She said, honey, there is nothing that I won't believe. You just tell me what's up. So I sit down and tell this perfect stranger this, the, the, all the details of this experience. And she said, oh, my God, that's amazing. And she called Tess over, the owner of the coffee shop. And she said, Tess has got to hear this. Mm-hmm. And so she said, tell Tess and I'm still traumatized. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm like, Oh my goodness. Okay. So I'm telling Tess and she said, Oh, how sweet, you know, she said, you went to a hell realm. The Buddha says that when you find yourself in a hell realm, you're there to mine jewels. Hmm. And, and I was like, mine jewels in hell. Wow. Okay, so that gave me that like popped me out of the trauma of it, right? And gave me a focus, a constructive focus, right? Like, so what were the jewels here in my own experience of um, attempting to support this man, you know, um, in his own hell experience? And and what I what in my own personal experience. Um, It was a very uh, like upper level of hell. It wasn't like the lower levels that we hear a lot about um, with hell experiencers. Um, So this is strictly from my perspective, my conclusion from my own processing is that E does equal MC square. That mass belief creates mass consciousness, mass consciousness, energy creates mass experience. It was an experiential reality. Um, However, it was a lie created. It was a, it was, there was mass there, but that mass was created on a a false belief system. And I, again, I'm speaking for myself here. I don't want to, you know, program anybody else. This is simply my experience. And so one of the things that happened when I was there, I was first like in a state of complete shock. And I was like, I didn't even want to look because everywhere in my periphery were people who couldn't even lift their hands up to ask for help. They didn't even, uh, they did not believe that they could ask to be released out of it. Right. And um, there I really experienced eternal what what eternal condemnation would feel like. There's no word to ex, uh, express the horridness of eternal condemnation. You know that complete belief in being trapped. And I kept talking to them and saying, "No, no, no! You all have believed a lie. You don't belong here. Like this place wasn't created for you. Like there's love for you." It doesn't matter. And, and I'd had a, in another psychopomp experience, I escorted somebody directly into the light, uh, which was a new experience for me. And so because of that experience, I knew firsthand for myself, right. That, that I, 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 I've had that experience of overwhelming beyond comprehension, love and allowance for our learning process. 
from the light. So I'm speaking that into this space of these people, um, these souls, and they did experience their body. It was, um, they still believed they had a physical human body. You know, that was their belief in, in their experience, much like a person who's lost an arm or a leg or a limb still has that phantom feeling. That's much the experience because again, E equals MC square. It really does. And so when I came out of my experience, I was very angry at religion, all organized religion um, could just take a deep dive into a dark hole for all I cared at that moment. Um, uh, my, my, so and here's another part of that challenge is the anger, right? It's like all of the sudden, you know, I'm living a life where I'm trying to do my own shadow work and I'm doing my best to receive as to, to be loving and forgiving, et cetera. And here comes this anger and unforgiveness within myself that this experience allowed me to examine more deeply um, the judgments and the lack of forgiveness that I still held, right? So um, when we work with people that have gone through a hell experience, I think it's really important like we do for any experience is to validate that that was their experience mm -hmm. and not try to relanguage it, not try to change it, not to give them our meaning for it, but to create a safe space where they can find the meaning that it is for them and to find what soul, what is the developmental aspect of their soul that they were able to now get in touch with that perhaps prior to the experience they could not. What do you do for people with relationship problems? Because it appears that 70% of people who have an NDE wind up in divorce. Yeah, that that statistic um, from the ASSIST survey research showed six, between 67 and 75%. So now that was, uh, that survey was done from 2009 to 2011. I don't know where we're at right now. Um, definitely more research needs to be done. That's why that was the motivation for me, right, to, to do the training here in Lubbock. Um, uh, there's a really good, so um, our assist, at, we do an annual conference and we did it, uh, there's, we'll be um, releasing those videos from the conference for sale uh, early next year. And there's a very good conversation about that uh, from Dr. Nicole Gruel um, about some key points for therapists to work with um, when they get these situations in their therapy session. But the first work is actually to work with the experiencer to say, okay, let's just drop the actual experience and not talk right now. Uh, what Nicole uh, uh, suggest is that we just put the actual experience to the side for a moment, right? And let's get curious about what needs to be discussed here about that, which, what are those changes? And can we get curious about what it's like for that other person now? So not just from the non-experiencer to the experiencer, but for the experiencer to allow space for the other person to process uh, the changes that are, are, are occurring now. And so it's a gentler approach from the experiencer, which is really challenging, right? So what these, ex it's not always just that the experience is now created a new God view or worldview for the experiencer, but it also brings up all the other weaknesses within the relationship, right? Now it's very possible that um, there are, there are people, and I and I know of some experiencers who absolutely refused to leave their partner, even though they no longer um, were compatible in that way. There was a deep commitment to care for them. And then there were others who couldn't do it anymore. Again, I believe it all comes down to fear. Fear from the experiencer to not get to expand and, and express and be what they've now discovered that is theirs for them to express and expand and be. Um, it's so it's 
kind of fear-based from the experiencer as well. And being an experiencer that went through divorce, I, I, I know that's true. And then also fear from the partner that they've lost the person that they've, that they married and that they fell in love with. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to have compassion for the partner first, and then to have strong boundaries for self. And so it's both and so that we can see what works for both people. And if it can't work out, you know, where is the love going to be in this relationship now? How is love going to express now? So I don't think that we can say one way or the other um, that we can, you know, cut that divorce rate in half. It would certainly be nice because of the trauma that occurs, especially if there's children involved. Um, but I know people that have gone through spiritual emergence uh, experience or spiritual emergency or a spiritually transformative experience that without regard to partner just up and left, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, the first thing is to not judge whatever happened, but to help both partners perhaps create a safe dialogue where we can address what is, what is the fear here and how can we reduce that fear and find mutual respect here. Do you find that it's more the experiencer or the partner that no Not longer even. wants to be in the relationship? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't have statistics on that, but I've seen both. I can't, I can't say. I don't have statistics on that. Okay. Yeah. What are the signs and symptoms of somebody who is having a spiritual emergency and needs help? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, there are people going through a spiritual emergency that it's very silent and uh, they don't discuss it. And there's an emptiness and a despondency internally. And they're still going through the motions of living their life, taking care of their family, going to work, and um, but feeling a sense of a lack of joy and uh, their health can deteriorate. And um, they no longer engage in those activities. So if, an, if a partner is uh, noticing a depression in their partner, right? Uh, and they may not be aware that the experience even occurred, uh, hopefully the partner would notice, hey, you know, I noticed something's wrong, you know, what, let's talk about it. Um, hopefully we're, we're becoming a little bit more emotionally astute that we wouldn't let that go. We could create safe space for our partner who seems to be struggling with something to talk about it. Um, and so that's, that's number one is just creates a safe space. Um, and then when, so if it's external and the partner's, you know, giving all the money away or quit their job, right? Uh, again, that conversation needs to happen um, in a loving environment with strong support with somebody maybe that's not attached, uh, you know, a good therapist. Now, I, I want to talk about resources here. Um, Assist has, uh, we train mental health professionals, and we do have a support directory on the Assist website, which is www.acistee.org. And if you go to the support directory, you'll see uh, mental health professionals, spiritual guidance counselors, and coaches. And so what I would recommend is looking through those profiles to find which one of them works with marriage and therapy, right? But the depending on how the emergency is presenting uh, will depend on what the support would look like. So if somebody is able to function in their daily life, but they're not functioning well, um, again, that deep conversation needs to occur. And if they're not functioning well, we need to take a look at their safety. Like what is at risk here? Um, are they uh, doing risky behaviors? Are they letting their money go? Are they um, not eating? Are they not sleeping, right? So let's take a look at how they're being safe and or how they're not being safe. So usually when we say emergency, there's some lack of safety there. So 
Um, again, finding somebody who's been trained in differential diagnosis, which all of our therapists have been trained in differential diagnosis. Um, we also need to look at the physical aspect. So especially for people going through a Kundalini awakening, it, there, it, you know, Kundalini uh, um, experiences ca uh, can mimic neurological disorders. So when we work with, when I work with people that uh, believe they're going through a Kundalini awakening, I ask them to go get, um, to go to their regular doctor and ask for a neurological exam and get a checkup because we don't want to miss those things. There could be heart problems. There could be central nervous issues, neurological issues, hearing issues, sight issues. So whether they're hearing voices, right? If they're hearing voices, we need to find out, are those voices benevolent or are those voices wanting to cause harm? Right. So there's many people that hear voices and they're okay with it. They can process it. They can be with it. They can work with what they're, who they're communicating with. Right. And there are other people who, who hear voices that are not okay with it, that want the experience to stop. They don't want to have any of that contact happening and it greatly disturbs them. Then we need to support them in finding a way to make that stop for them whether it is an actual case of true schizophrenia, or if it's in a state of acute phase spiritual emergency. So finding out where this person is, are they okay with what's happening? Are they safe? And then what relationships, their relationships, their health and their finances will kind of support those things, those basic three needs. Um, need in order so that they can stay safe, stable, and um, healthy. Are there any other things that a person can do on their own that they can help themselves besides creating the safe space? Yeah. Um, again, because we're talking about a wide range, right, uh, of people, uh, there are people, whether they're on medication, when the experience happens, um, or they're not, if they're on their medication, when the experience happens and they want to get off the medication, they need to find a professional that will help them do that safely. If that's what they want to do. Okay. And to not go off medication on their own, and it's very dangerous and can create all sorts of uh, psychological problems as well as, um, a risk of suicide. So. Uh, if somebody's on medication and wants to get off, get professional support. There are people, there are professionals that can help you look at alternatives and make sure that they are somebody who is STE trained and also a psychiatrist. They are out there. We do have them on our website mm. um, and they can help you be safe. Um, if you're not on medication and you generally feel safe, but you need somebody to talk to. I think the very first important thing that you can do for yourself is to find a community of people. And fortunately now, like, you know, in 2007 to really 2014, I mean, we certainly didn't have anything or 2013, we certainly didn't have anything here other than our organization. But now there's so many groups on Facebook, a very reputable uh, Facebook group is Shades of Awakening. There's so many people on there and they have great moderators. You can join the uh, assist private online forum or a small support group, peer support, uh, peer support uh, group for STEs. Uh, I actually train those facilitators. Those are free. So there's many free sources and free groups through assist. IONS also has some good uh, support groups, conversation groups, right? So that's the first thing is to find safe community, somebody to talk to that understands and has maybe had a similar experience and maybe even similar challenges in the support groups. What's really lovely is what's happening in the very small support groups is they're listening to other experiencers share the challenges that they went through and how they managed it, how they integrated and they've got another, um, and that gives them hope. It gives them another 
potential practice, right? So very first, uh, make sure you're safe and psychologically safe and find community and support. Now on your own, um, it, it really depends. So if you haven't been eating meat and you've been meditating, then you need to eat meat and perhaps stop temporarily meditating for a while. Okay. To help you uh, get more connected to the body and meat is a typical grounding food. Uh, root vegetables are grounding food, taking a look at your, you know, maybe getting a blood test to see where your mineral levels are. That's another really important thing. Things like magnesium, potassium, sodium, you know, if those basic minerals are off, they make, and our hormones are off, they make all of life <laughs> hard, but especially if you're having a challenging experience to integrate is to remember your physical body. It's really inexpensive to go get those tests those blood tests. Um, uh, I usually refer people to uh, any lab test now. There's a, they have a lot of different locations around the country. You don't need a prescription to go in and find out where your, your basic mineral levels are. And people might want to, you know, uh, join a spiritual community or, or um, get out of society and go on grid and get off the electronics for a while. Um, that may be helpful. And also please do uh, pay attention to the physical body because it does affect how we are able to handle the stress of anything that we're going through. And when we're dealing with the nonlinear realms where we might be open um, to more information than what we, our brain is used to processing, we need to make very um, sure that you're sleeping well and you're getting enough sleep and you're getting proper nutrition and exercise. So sometimes it's recommended that you don't do yoga if you did were doing yoga, but just do maybe some light walking or swimming or some physical activity out in the sun. So those are just some real basic things to do. And they sound like they wouldn't be very helpful, but they actually really are. It's interesting because I was going to ask, should people start meditating? But you said, if they already are, then to stop. If what they're if they're not state. meditating? Yeah, if they're not meditating, um, again, because it's so individual, um, if they're not meditating and they're in a state of emergency, um, I wouldn't want to know, you know, are they hearing voices? Um, are it, Do they have too much electricity running through their body? Sometimes meditation might exacerbate, especially if you're having a lot of nonlinear contact, um, the meditation may exacerbate it. If you're not trained in meditation and you don't have a teacher that can help you create healthy boundaries. Okay. The other thing that I tell people with meditation is look, um, just like you need to have healthy boundaries with the people that are in your life that have skin and bones, you need to have healthy boundaries with the people that, you know, are talking to you that don't have skin and bones. You, you get to decide um, who you're communicating with. So if you go into meditation with no instruction, no teacher, nobody that knows how to navigate um, those nonlinear, those astral realms, then meditation can sometimes be more harmful. So the very first thing is to practice clear energy boundaries. Um, and sometimes we do use and employ the breath. So one thing that works exceptionally well um, with the breath, um, maybe not necessarily a meditation, but a breath process is um, we all scatter our energy throughout the day by the things that we're looking at on a screen or we're hearing or we're seeing or the conversations that we have. So if we breathe in and gather and gather in our energy from all of the places that it's been scattered, our mind energy. So as we breathe in, we gather. And then as we breathe out, we ground that energy down into the ground through our feet and up to our spiritual connection with a direct connection and then ask to be covered in white light that will help protect us. Um, there's a blue light that can also be used like this bright electric brew on our, our uh, mm -hmm. backgrounds that we both chose, right? Um, it's uh, my, my children um, also um, 
you know, had experiences from a young age. And I would teach them to use that bright electric blue bug zapper light because, you know, they were children and they understood a bug zapper um, to, to surround their aura with that so that any unwanted um, communication would not be able to get through in and, and to bother them. And, and there is something about that bright electric blue energy that is very protective. It's even associated with the sword of Archangel Michael, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's something about that frequency that doesn't allow that in. So if somebody's worried about being protected and safe, I would recommend that white and blue energy and using the breath to get anchored above and below. And also to get your feet on the ground outside as much as possible and getting connected to the earth. That's very grounding. So uh, any other formal meditations for somebody that's not used to meditating, I would um, ask them to get a meditation teacher, a reputable teacher. Some of my guests have mentioned that they've become clairaudient after their NDEs, and you're mentioning about hearing voices, and then you mentioned about true schizophrenia. Can you kind of comment a little bit deeper about the difference between the two? Well, I'm not a mental trained mental health professional myself, mm -hmm. but I, I will say that there, there is a difference. Now I've worked with both, but I will tell you the problem with people who are having a chemical imbalance in their brain, or there's, you know, something happening in the brain. Schizophrenia is a brain issue. It's a brain disorder. Something is not working in the brain. Okay. Um, now in their chemicals or neuro hormone, their hormones, their neuropeptides, neurotransmitters, there's something going on in the brain. Okay. However, that being said, um, demonic and satanic and dark energies love those poor people mm. because their, their mind is already so weak and because they don't have a strong sense of identity they're easily taken over by satanic and demonic dark energies and played with and tortured. And so um, shama uh, shamans are good people to help you if you're being bothered by the darker voices or the intrusive voices. Um, however, what's more important than anything else is to develop a strong identity and a strong sense of self value and self worth and, and an identity of you know, being your light being that you are. Because the stronger your identity is, whether you're working with somebody um, that's in the physical or somebody in the non-physical that's attempting um, to bring you down, uh, to scare you, to cause you harm, we set boundaries with those people, right? but we can't set boundaries with those people if we have codependency issues or identity wounds from childhood that haven't been um, healed, right? We lose our boundaries. So oftentimes um, when people are hearing voices that are troublesome, uh, I, I would examine if they do have some unhealed trauma that has affected their self-esteem and their self-worth and um, refer them to a good trauma therapist to work on that. And then that oftentimes can stop that problem. So, but the, um, with a, someone that has a, a schizophrenia because there's a brain disorder that's occurring and it's an organic brain issue, um, a, sh a shaman can go in and remove those entities for that person, but because their mind is weak, they will come back. Um, some of my NDE experiencers tend to be mediums afterwards. So would this yes. basically apply to them as well? Oh, sure. You know, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that happens when we're able to expand our consciousness and be of service to anyone, um, whether they're in their body or not. Uh, and and for often, uh, oftentimes when experiencers come back with that um, ex that gift, right? It's part of their function now is to be a psychopomp and to support people in healing and, and moving forward on their path on the other side or healing a relationship that was left unsettled here on earth, right? That they can't move forward. 
until they heal that relationship here on earth. And so mediums provide their beautiful, uh, that beautiful healing service. And now um, mediums are even being used by some grief therapists as well. They're using after death communication and grief therapy. So the value of, of being a medium is now being recognized in the mental health field. Not broadly, unfortunately, but it is. You use the word psychopomp. Can you, what is that word? Can you tell me? Yeah. Please? Yeah. So it's actually, uh, it's something that I'd done since I was 13 years old mm -hmm. um, and didn't know that there was a term for it until the conference that I went to in 2014 um, when I uh, shared about my experience and somebody said, you know, have you heard about this term? And I said, no. And when I looked it up, I was like, oh my God, that's me. Mm. So there is a, um, uh, there are people like myself that have access to people that have transitioned that get stuck and they can't go into the light. They can't go forward into their journey, wherever that might be for them. I call it their next level of learning. And uh, because usually because they are afraid, like they didn't go to hell, but they didn't go into the light mm. either. Okay. And so they're in hiding or they're stuck or they're confused. Um, and so they need a little nudge, right. To ask for help, to move into uh, the light or their next level. And so when this happens different for, differently for anybody. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Father Nathan Castle, a Catholic priest that does this work, um, spoke, I think, at the last IONS conference. And he talks about, you know, his psychopomp work started in the dream state mm -hmm. where people will come to him as he's dreaming. And then he works with, uh, he calls them his prayer partner to help him communicate and counsel this person to go ahead and move forward into God's love. So um, some people like myself, um, I would just get pulled out of my body. Um, and, you know, and uh, uh, I said, you know, it was like getting knocked out by spirit, like spirit would knock out my physical body. And I would just go to like, start going to sleep, no matter what I was doing or where I was, except for driving, you know, they weren't reckless, of course. Uh, but at my house, in my home, um, when I was alone, they would sometimes just knock me out and then I would be out of my body and in different places with these people that they were stuck in, in astral realms or in the death process. Um, and I would be sent to a hospital room, so to speak. And so this process of being able to sense, hear, or see, or, or be with someone who has made that transition from the physical to the non-physical, and then help them move on. Now, some people, um, hospice workers are considered psychopomps as well, mm. because they're helping somebody in that transition process from death into the new life, but they're working with them while they're still here in their body. Some of the experiencers go into the black void. Do you know yeah. what that is or what is your opinion of what that is? Um, with some of the experiences that I've worked with, it's been different actually for all of them. So in the expansion of the process of the expansion of consciousness, there is a place where there is nothing, where it appears that there is nothing, right? That is the space. And some people get there and there are some religious texts that say that that's it. Like that is the highest experience, the, the nothingness, right? The silent mind, the nothing. And uh, however, that is not the final stage. There is more beyond that. So in this place where there is nothing, it is a transition into a state of allness, not oneness, but allness. And in that allness state, um, uh, it, there's, you know, to get from, to get from the nothingness to the allness and this, I'm speaking to you, to you from theory. Okay. And, and not experience. Um, but from theory, from my teachers that, that surrender into the fears of the nothingness. Now there is peace, 
But at some point, as you progress further into the nothingness, you will experience a fear of annihilation. Because what's happening for most people in that void is they still have a sense of an identity. It's not true nothingness. Mm -hmm. Because they have not yet surrendered their idea and of, of themselves. And that individuated consciousness hasn't been surrendered yet because that is the final death. Mm -hmm. Surrendering the uh, individuated identity back into allness then creates the final bliss. There can be an experience in the nothingness. There is um, sometimes a state of peace and sometimes a state of nothingness but often people mistake peace for nothingness because we're so used to being happy or being sad or being entertained or being bored mm -hmm. right being in love or hating or you know pain and suffering or happiness and it's this peace is right here in the middle of all of it but we keep going up and over that line you know up and down over that line of peace Peace is a very flat line experience. Um, it comes after the experience of bliss. And uh, in my experience of that, um, it was very confusing. I was like, what is this? Right? I'm not happy. I'm not sad. I'm not this. I'm not that. There's this, there's this nothingness, but it's really peace. It's that release of needing one experience or the other. So in order to progress beyond all of that, um, then the enculturated identity, which is an individual at some point, becomes this identity of being a spiritual individual that we co-create, you know, that we have this function and this purpose and whatever. But in the, in the, in the way vastness of the void, we, if we surrender into that, then we experience that fear that I am nothing. And once we surrender that fear that I am nothing, and we, and we, and we let that without fear go into um, further, then we go into the final enlightenment. But most people don't experience that state here. Mm -hmm. I was confused at first, but it sounds like that's a good thing that when you surrender the fear, you surrender your ego and you just become one with everything that, like I said, to that's maintain a good, that, that's a good thing, that's a good but thing. to maintain that is extremely difficult. Okay. And, and, it, and so to maintain that is extremely difficult. And, um, and that is the point where people do go into uh, monasteries, abbeys, ashrams, um, go off, you know, and live out of their truck or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so again, we can't, we can't judge whether somebody, you know, you have, to, it takes a skilled teacher to know, is this person having a temporary experience of moving in there? right into that beginnings, those, those upper regions, uh, because most of the time when we have these experience, it's a little, Oh, now I have a new point of reference. It's a little blip of our normal up and down over the line of peace, right? We have these higher experiences and, or these very lower experiences into hell. And it's just a temporary little, Oh, look at this. You could find peace here, mm -hmm. right? Oh, look, you could drop your judgments and uh, be happy. You could be a loving person and make other people happy, right? Um, um, oh, look, here's your shadow. You know, this is the pain and suffering that it's causing. Let's go do something about that. Most of the time, it's just these temporary reference points. Mm -hmm. um, when it's time, when the consciousness is ripe and it's time um, to stay in that higher space, then people will, um, and again, it's very rare, and people will go into ashrams or monasteries or hermitages for a very, very long time, three, four, five years, maybe even 10, maybe even 20, but then they come back 
you know, into some form, um, they either pass on or they go on into some active service or teaching. Those are very few. Once you're at a level where you're not coming back, you're there for good. Do you Mm. usually fade into that nothingness or do you still retain the ego and do other things or both? So my, my current understanding is, is for those few that have that, Um, there's always like one tiny little percent of ego until you're fully. So that's Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster. The only ones that fully attained that. Okay. Now we have other people on this planet that have attained degrees of that enlightenment. And there's always a risk because there's always a little bit of ego because you've got to have ego to exist on the planet. Right. Right. So there's always a little bit. So as you increase in consciousness, it's an ascending scale of descending ego. But that ego has now been surrendered and is now in employment and in service to the light. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but there's always a little bit of ego. That's why you know, uh, teachers have fallen. There have been, you know, really good modern day teachers that have fallen because they get to that point, but then those tests. So the guardians at the gate, you know, are there to test for power, to test for seduction, to test for, you know, material gain. And it's not that material gain is wrong. Maybe you're supposed to go make millions and billions of dollars and learn how to use that for the sake and betterment of humanity and the planet right? Or maybe you're not. It it depends upon your individuated karma. That's why we can't pass judgment on how somebody, how this process of the integration of a higher consciousness flows through an individual is their own individual karma and to place judgments and supposed to look like this and you should do that. And that's what this means onto somebody else is really, really inappropriate. All right. One last question. If you are there for good, you surrender your ego. If you decide to move on to another realm or you come back to this and reincarnate, does your ego come back to mm. you or what, what happens? Okay. So there, for those at the highest levels, there is um, um, something beyond uh, which you might call the second light that they go into, that the light that most people see is the first light. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about those super high level rare beings on the planet, they go beyond and their consciousness that what we consider that ego, that separated sense of self, be a constructive or a destructive ego, right? Um, that completely falls away and they go back into that light. And what, where they go after that, we don't know. Like some stay in service to the planet as a consciousness that we can tap into. And some um, go to a place where it appears as if they never existed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where all of their, what they did here is as if it never existed, where they're going. Now, so then the others depend it's so individual so you know when you reach that beginning stage of enlightenment you still have your own work to do there's still some ego Mm -hmm. and and i always talk about the 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 developmental tasks of the soul and so when you work with somebody who's had these experiences to give them space to go in and listen Um, to their spirit as to what is the next developmental task for me here. You know, maybe it's my dharma or my karma to go teach. Maybe it's my karma to go teach people how to garden and maybe nobody knows my name. And then, or maybe I become, you know, a a more of a world teacher. Um, Or maybe I work on changing the consciousness at the corporate level. Mm -hmm. So there are seven realms in the 3D that light and dark are always flowing through. And so usually prior karmic agreement would have decided which realm you're going to be activated in. 
and that light that flows through you now, that con higher consciousness that flows through your uh, individuated expression as a human is going to flow through one of those seven realms or one or more of those seven realms. I think probably what I should have asked is, and I think I get it now, we'll see, is that the average person you know, after they transition to the other side, they probably don't ever surrender into complete nothingness. They do whatever they're doing and then they come back. Is that Would that be correct? Generally speaking, yes. Um, but there are other places to be of service to besides this particular planet. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, um, whether they come back here and then does that ego exist? Um, the lessons continue, right? So if they move on to other uh, dimensions and other systems, um, the expression of that individuated consciousness that we call the ego um, will take on the uh, planetary um, consciousness of where they go, wherever that is that they go. And it's kind of hard to compare that those other places to here, those other dimensions to, to the third dimension of Earth. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do of they course. find you? Sure. My email is elizabethj.sabet at gmail.com. Um, my website right now is elizabethjsabet.com. And also ittcinternational.com, uh, which is the Institute of Transformational Transpersonal Coaching. But if they just want to shoot me a question, I'll be happy to, to visit with them. They can just email me. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want us to know about? If there are experiencers here who would uh, like to join the assist forum and need safe community, I would highly encourage you to do that. You can email us at info at ACISTE.org and ask to be added to the forum. Um, I'll be doing some live community conversations on the forum on a quarterly basis next year. Um, I'll also be doing free uh, so, uh, peer support group Oh, the, the training is not free, but I'll be doing training for peer support group facilitators uh, in 2022. If they're interested in that, they can email us at the info at assist.org. And um, I also train people to become spiritual integration coaches as well, as well as my own private practice. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? Oh, yes. Mm. Um, be so grateful if you've had a near death experience or any experience at all, even the dark and the hell realms, be grateful because I believe with all my heart that these experiences have come to grow us, to help us, to learn how to receive more love. Um, and at the, because we must be able to receive more love to be a loving blessing to others. And so um, just seek the growth and the developmental opportunity that your experience is here to give you. Thank you for that message. And Elizabeth, thank you so much for being my guest today. I really you. appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you. And same, thank you so much for your podcast. It's such a great service. Thank you. Okay, have a great day over there. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.